I'm Tim Randles, and I'm with Los Alamos National Lab. I'm going to talk today a little bit about um, some neutron slurm integration work that we're doing. So we'll cover quickly a little bit of the past work. Um, it lays a little groundwork. Um, talk about the cluster requirements for the plugin that we've written, um, the new plugin, select OpenStack, and then some future work ideas. So this motivation and background slide, I stole from a talk I gave in Austin in um, the last summit. And I think, I, I put it up here purposely because I think it should just sort of be a priori knowledge now when someone gives a talk like this, that these requirements, I've heard four or five times at different talks uh, so far at the summit, um, that users want more flexibility from their HPC resources. We tend to build HPC resources and finely tune them for MPI jobs. But increasingly, we have users that, well, not increasingly, it's, it's been a long-standing problem. Um, that solution, you hope, meets 70, 80, whatever metric you use, percent of your uh, user population. But users increasingly, and I do think this is true, have more complex dependencies in their software than ever before. They have build time requirements, um, build systems such as Ant and Maven, um, the Python runtime wants to run off. A lot of these things expect to have unfettered internet access. We don't typically give that from our uh, compute nodes inside of a cluster. Um, we've always had validated and vendor supplied software stacks. That's not a new problem. The problem comes when you have to build a Venn diagram of requirements of what OS you can run on your cluster so that you meet all of the vendor requirements or you decide which vendors you just won't go to for support when something doesn't work. Um, and then there's legacy code with legacy requirements. This in particular at Los Alamos is important for us. We've been doing heavy computational work for 70 years now. Um, and while we're not going to try to recreate the Cray 1 environment or Maniac or something like that, we do have codes that we need that are constantly being updated for new architectures that we need to validate the updated code results against the old code. Um, and the old code in this case is probably 15 or 20 years old. So if we can run the environment we ran 15 or 20 years ago, um, it's largely x86, so it'll be a Pentium class processor we need to provide through something like a VM. Um, code teams can go back and rerun that in a virtual environment with the old input decks and the new input decks and see if the new models match. Uh, increasingly, there are data intensive frameworks being developed, Hadoop with uh, the Yarn Resource Manager and Hadoop 2, a Spark, which can be executed through Apache Mesos or Yarn or Standalone, but you notice Slurm, Torque, PBS, these aren't resource managers that these frameworks can interface with easily today. So we need some way to let users run data intensive um, frameworks at the kind of scale we have in our HPC centers. Now they rely on closet clusters. They've got a rack in a closet somewhere, they've got a bunch of workstations that should have been retired five or six years ago loosely clustered together so that they can run these things, but they can't run them at a scale that really means anything for them. And users also want an environment they understand and control. Um, the, the OS we run is, is uh, Red Hat based, based on Red Hat 6, so it's still supported, but users are running things much newer than that. Usually it's Ubuntu 16 or something. Um, they want Python 3. These things exist for Red Hat 6. You have to jump through some hoops to get them, or you're building them by yourself and supporting them. But these reasons are common. That we see them all the time. So I think what the discussion should shift to is, we understand why people want flexibility, but how are we gonna meet flexibility in our environments? And where does the, um, where's the, the line of demarcation between a traditional HPC resource that runs HPC workloads, MPI workloads and such, and the newer runtime frameworks, can they coexist on the same hardware and neither one of them is the, uh, the lesser for it. And I think the answer is yes. Um, I'd be really interested in having conversations with everybody who's interested in this about how they think they wanna do it. I think some of the prejudices that exist on building flexibility into an HPC system, uh, such as IO is bad in a VM. Well, that may be not true anymore. Um, we need to break down some of these barriers and start talking about tighter integration between, <coughs> excuse me, between these uh, newer technologies and our old way of doing things. So the past effort um, to provide some of these frameworks 
Um, Gloam was a, an HPC style machine. It was repurposed HPC hardware, but we just built it as a Hadoop 2 cluster. We built it the way the Hadoop folks told you to build it. And um, we ran Hadoop on it, we ran Spark on it. It was right after Hadoop 2 was released in late 2013. So the Spark support, um, the, sorry, the Yarn support for Spark was not very good. But users play with it a little bit, didn't really like it. Um, we're an HPC center. Users aren't used to writing anything in Java. So they, they felt crippled. The, 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 um, the barrier to, to learning Java to be productive with Java was, was high enough that they never really did more than write some hello worlds and kick the tires and wander away and say, this isn't for me. To address different Linux distributions, we had built another machine. It was a mirror of GLOME, actually, called Charlie Cloud, or called Kugel. But on it, we ran Charlie Cloud VMs. And Charlie Cloud is an internally developed um, orchestration engine. You might be looking at me saying, what's well, your at the OpenStack conference? Why didn't you just install Cloud and Nova and let it fire off your VMs? What we were trying to do was come up with a lightweight framework that was very simple to understand that would allow the cluster to run traditional MPI jobs on the cluster or Charlie Cloud VMs, and no one's interfering with each other. So we built some plumbing and framework in Charlie Cloud to fire off VMs, um, QAMU and KVM, that when it wasn't running, it just looked like a normal HPC. There, wasn't a, there, there was no Neutron service running. There was no Nova service running. We didn't want to introduce a lot of system noise and jitter for the MPI jobs that would come along later. It wasn't very successful. Um, for a user who says, just give me Ubuntu, and I tell them, great, well, you can build a virtual machine, you can install these scripts inside your virtual machine, then you can copy it into our infrastructure, and then you change your job submission script to do all this Charlie Cloud stuff, and then you're, but trust us, just your VM's gonna run. There wasn't much uptake. They didn't, um, we had a, a few brave users, but it, it wasn't widely used. So our current direction is something we're thinking of as a converged uh, data compute machine. It's Woodchuck, we've had it around for about a year now. Um, and there we're developing something called Charlie Cloud Containers. So once again, why are you using Charlie Cloud for containers? Um, we, want, we wanted a container implementation that was once again small, simple, and was unprivileged. I'm never going to give a user access to the Docker group so he can have root on my systems. So we wanted something that was small, easily auditable, started up a user namespace and a mount namespace so a user could bind file systems into it that they had permissions to bind into it. And that was it. So a user could run this, he could get, do an M alloc, or a, sorry, a S alloc, get a compute node, SSH into it, run the Charlie Cloud tool, and then he would land in his container environment. It's small. Um, I have a link for a, a research paper we wrote on a technical review. Um, if anybody's interested, just talk to me afterwards. <clears throat> I'm forgetting something, but okay. So for Charlie Cloud VMs, we had some, some complex network configurations that were required to secure this thing. Um, this is uh, the low-hanging fruit of, of security vulnerabilities. A user requests two compute nodes and their VMs start up on those compute nodes and the compute nodes are mounting the parallel file system. In our case, it's Lustre, or maybe at that time it was Panassas. But either way, it's an IP-based access model. We don't, you know, the large parallel file systems don't authenticate generally. They want to be fast. So the, the, the um, exploit here, the, the obvious one is, user takes the IP off compute node two, he owns the VM, he's got root, puts the IP in there, he crashes node two, he mounts your parallel file system, he owns all your data. This is really bad. We can't have this in any environment, let alone uh, where we're at. So the schematic view here, Slurm would fire up the VM, we use MPI run, uh, starts the, the virtual machine on whatever allocation the user has. The user does this, and he's sending evil packets off to the parallel file system, he's stealing all your data. So we get Slurm to actually use epilogue and prologue scripts to set up a firewall. So now we're gonna block packets. And the firewall is pretty simple at this point because if the IP address of the VM, or the, if the source address of the packet isn't what the VM should be, we're just gonna block it. <clears throat> but a single node job isn't very useful for most people. 
So then we had to get fancier with our firewall configuration and allow the good packets to go off to the right places and the bad packets get stopped. And all the while we're introducing complexity, we're introducing failure modes. Um, if a job crashes, that firewall disappears, the job might come back, um, the, jo um, the node might come back, the job's still running. We had all sorts of problems um, in this. And the fr the really it was the fragility scared us. So using Charlie Cloud, user requests a Charlie Cloud container, it lands on the compute node. We have a separate physical network to mount the file system over, the parallel file system. We dedicated an Ethernet interface for the Charlie Cloud container, and we use Slurm to join the Charlie Cloud, or to create a new network namespace and, and give it to the container. Then we bind mount in the parallel file system. The user has what they need. A lot cleaner, we don't have taps, we don't have bridges, we don't have the, the overhead that that introduces, we don't have complex firewall setups, but they have unfettered access to everything right now over this dedicated ethernet. So what we're looking for is enhanced security and resource availability in this mode of operation. We want network isolation for the user jobs. We want Charlie Cloud to have um, hardware level access to the network for the job without putting a bunch of barriers in its place. So we want to isolate those jobs so that they can't do evil things to each other. So we want to use VLANs instead of firewalls and bridges. The hardware supports this. Our switch hardware supports it. Let's take advantage of it. Um, we're going to get better performance all around. Even if we're going to run a VM, we're going to run an old Charlie Cloud VM. In this mode of operation, we can give the VM access to the hardware via PCI pass-through or SRIOV, the, the, the network itself is going to isolate this job and only allow it to have access to what it should have access to. Um, and then this should open up the possibility of dynamic access to network attached resources. So file systems, databases, on-demand networks, a common use case that we encounter is a user has a database and he's running it on his closet cluster because the program manager says that database needs to be protected for some reason. Currently, when they want to scale up, they have to buy more hardware. When the hardware needs to be refreshed, they have to have a fight with the program manager to get you know, some number of zeros of dollars to go buy more hardware. If we had the ability to cite their database on a network that our clusters have access to, or we do today, the only granularity we have is this cluster can see that database, not that compute node can see the database. So we tell the users, well, of course, it's a multi-user you know, multi cluster. We're not going to build a cluster for just you guys. Um, but beware that anybody on the cluster can hammer away at your database and try to get into it. We want to we you know, build a system that allows this to happen. So in this view, we have Charlie Cloud with its dedicated interface. And then let's say it's connected to 10 gigabit Ethernet. In this case, it actually is. Um, I think if we had a little more money, we could have gone with 40. Regardless, it's basically IP over IB, but with VLANs, because IB partitioning isn't dynamic, and there's only 16 of them, and I can, can't run many jobs. So there's the database that lives on the network, and the colors denote VLANs. So your Charlie Cloud job's there. Slurm talks to Neutron and says, compute job's running. It's allowed to have access to the database. Create my VLAN. Yay, my job can see it. When the job's done, Neutron goes off to the SDN controller and says, take this node out of the VLAN. We don't need that access anymore. Database disappears from the fabric. User has multiple nodes or there are multiple users. We don't want them to talk to each other. So we dynamically create a VLAN and we put the user's jobs in the VLAN so he can't bludgeon someone else to death. Once again, we have an ethernet fabric here, so congestion gets to be a real problem. Um, users have inadvertently denial of service to each other by doing bad network things. So to make this all work, Neutron has to control your, the network that you're allowing the containers to be provisioned upon. So in our case, we're doing something simple. It's a provider network, and it's just VLANs. We're not, we don't want open vSwitch. Uh, once again, we don't want to introduce this layer of host complexity that introduces um, performance penalties, um, complexity of configuration. I'm the one that's on call for this. The other 12 people on the team think I'm crazy. They don't want to get an on-call ticket saying packets aren't flowing and it has 
you know, it's because uh, OVS is messed up in some way and they have no idea how to debug it. Topology aware switches. The way this works is the switch has to know which node's on which port. So you run LLDP, it talks back to the switch. Topology gets communicated through the switches back to the SDN controller. Uh, you need an SDN controller. I'm using Arista hardware and the Cloud Vision stuff's just built in, works well. I run, Arista will tell you, run a virtual machine of this. So we have VEOS running uh, that acts as our SDN controller to talk to our physical fabric. Other vendors have similar solutions. We need the Neutron ML2 plugin to work. Um, vendor might have a solution. The vendor probably has an ML2 plugin available for you. And we need Nova with the fake driver. We'll get to that in a sec. So what we've done with this Neutron integration with Slurm is we've replaced the complexity of the Charlie Cloud VM configuration and scripts. We don't rely on epilogue and prologue anymore. Um, we did run into cases where IP tables would hang. So epilogue would hang, but SlurmD had already told the control D that the job was finished and that the node was available, and then nodes start landing on this misconfigured node, or jobs start landing on this misconfigured node and dying. Uh, users don't like it when you drain the queue by killing their jobs. This required modifications to an existing plugin. I wrote job submit OpenStack Glance back in the spring, and that was for uh, the image management portion of this. It's now been renamed job submit OpenStack because we're validating not only image requests, but network requests that the users can make. So if the user wants that database on his network, he's gonna have to request it somehow. We're gonna validate that in the job submit plugin. And then it required a new plugin, uh, select OpenStack. And this is what actually interfaces with Neutron to create networks, create subnet, um, does the Nova boot part, uh, deletes everything when the job terminates, take the cluster back to a known state. So how does a user actually use this? They just put an S batch uh, option in their job submit script. In the spring, it was uh, GRES, a generic resource request, UDSS, which is user defined software stack, and that's what we use internally to call it, and then some name of an image that lives in the glance registry. If it's not there, we're not gonna accept your job and you can fix it. We're not gonna load the queue up with things that are gonna fail. Now we've added network ability. So a user can ask, a ask for a network, has to match the network name that's in Neutron. Pretty straightforward, handles both cases. The job submit plugin workflow, this is also from the spring. Um, it's kind of obvious. It, um, you know, it, it looks for the requested resource, did you ask for anything? If you did, let's get data about it. Um, does it exist? No, then resubmit your job. Um, is a user allowed to grab an existing image? Is it public? Are they uh, in a member tenant? It's allowed for the image, yes, no. We go ahead and, and pass on. What we did to expand this to handle the network request was replaced image with net, replaced glance with neutron. Um, it's pretty straightforward, but it's the same workflow. The select OpenStack plugin. So I talked to our, our, one of our scheduler experts and he said, why would you want to overload a select plugin to do this? And I pointed at him at the documentation on the SCEDMD site. This is the mechanism for providing, or providing a mechanism for performing any system specific tasks for job launch and termination. He said, well, select's supposed to be very fast. It's supposed to just come back. You're supposed to get the allocation and the job should start executing. I, and then I said, well, Cray's already done a lot of this work for me. Because Cray is using this same mechanism to handle a lot of the um, setup and, and cleanup of their, their blades in an XC architecture. And on an XC from Cray, they don't tend to run Slurm through the whole thing. They run Alps, and Alps is their own resource manager. And there's a translation layer built into their plugin that actually takes Slurm, like what nodes am I allocated and things like this, and translates it into Alps and then pushes it into the Alps resource manager. Um, so Cray's done a lot of work for me. I use their wrapper plugin, the other select, and then I use their select Cray plugin as just a blueprint for my own. So in the select API, there's select P, select job begin, and there's select P, select job Fini. Um, begin handles creation of the network, the subnet, uh, does a Nova boot, does not do revalidation. Um, and then job termination, we tear it all down. But is this deceptively simple? Well, yes and no. 
the neutron net create, and I put this in terms of, of the command line tools you may be familiar with. I'm not actually reaching outside of Slurm to, to run the CLI. Uh, this is written in C. So we're building um, JSON payloads and parsing JSON, JSON responses, but we're calling the uh, RESTful API directly using curl. So netcreate is straightforward. The very nice thing about this is when we first started this, we thought we would just directly control the switches from Slurm, and then we started down the road of, but how do I know which VLAN belongs to which job? How do I know um, if it's an existing VLAN? How do I get the information? We were quickly realizing we we're gonna build our own database that described the network on the cluster, but Neutron's already got that. In fact, Neutron, I just, you configure it properly to do uh, provider networks and VLANs. You give it a resource pool of VLANs. You say you can use VLAN 100 through 4,000, and it just takes care of it. It knows if it's in use, it, it takes it back, it talks to your SDN controller to know. So that solved a huge problem for us. Subnet create is necessary for instances to use Neutron Network. So if you create a network and you tell Nova to boot and use that network, it's gonna come right back and say, well, the, there's no subnet on that, I can't use it. So this is a step that is required but does nothing, basically. It just meets a condition that Nova needs to go ahead and, and create the fake instance. Nova boot, you specify the networks, you know how that works. Um, but you need to specify which nodes. And then you're gonna boot what? Because I'm not actually booting anything. And then Nova delete and Neutron delete, does this leave anything behind? Nova delete, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. Neutron delete, I'm not doing a subnet delete because I can't find a subnet after I delete a network that the subnet belongs to. If anybody knows if it's filling up orphan rows in a table somewhere of subnets, let me know because I haven't seen them, but I uh, haven't looked real hard either. This part was a problem for us, kind of. So boot what? We're using the Nova fake driver, we don't care. It doesn't matter. You just need to tell Neutron that you wanna boot something that actually exists in the glance registry and that um, there's a flavor that actually exists so it can resolve these things. So it doesn't think that you're asking for something it can't provide. Um, and then which nodes? In this case, we're using availability zones. You can specify an availability zone. Um, we're giving it the cluster name because we envision this being at the center of our backend infrastructure so that we may have multiple network or multiple clusters that we're configuring from here. And then you specify the networks you need and then you give it some name. At LANL, we use two letter abbreviations for all of our clusters. So Woodchuck, a uh, compute node is WC001, it's the first compute node. Uh, the, we have an availability zone mapped out with all the compute nodes in it. Um, the network name, if you get in and start poking, if you have Horizon running and you start looking at your networks, that's the job ID from the Slurm job. So it's Woodchuck job 1234 has this network. My DB, that comes in from the user request if you want something. And then what did I boot? Nova needs a name, uh, name for the host and it needs to be deterministic. So it's the, the, the cluster, the job ID, and then the host name. So other minor details here. Um, how are we gonna get login node access to the containers? Because we've said that the containers are on their own physical interface, on their own fabric, and we VLAN them. So we made it deliberately hard to get to them, and now we need to make it easy to get to them. The first use case is, well, we'll just stick uh, an access port, you know, we'll, we'll put an interface on our login node, we'll plug it into the fabric, we'll put it in trunking mode, it can see all the VLANs, user can just go ahead and, and SSH into their container if it's running SSHD. But then anyone, of course, can try to access your container. The argument right now is, well, anybody can try to access your compute node. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that maybe the user created the container or the virtual machine. They didn't secure it, they didn't, you know, they left a default password somewhere, they didn't put a password in it. So I think what we're gonna end up doing uh, in the short term is using something like CloudInit to insert a user's key, SSH key into the container so that only he can get into it and not allow password authentication. And if we find containers that have password authentication enabled, we're gonna tell them they can't run them in the short term. Um, a long, longer term idea that we have, and it's one that I'd love to discuss if anybody's done anything this style, um, our users log into a gateway to reach our front end network or our login nodes. 
we would like to, to come up with a system where they hit the, the login or the, the gateway, and then they, instead of SSHing to the login node, make a request. And maybe this is OpenStack running as just a cloud manager. What they end up with is a, v, is a, a VM on the physical node attached to that cluster, VXLAN with a gateway into the VLAN. Well, it won't be into the VLAN initially because they haven't submitted a job yet, but set up an arrangement where users are sandboxing VMs on our physical hardware, and then the, the VTEPs are set up when their jobs are submitted so that they can get to the nodes that are in their job allocation. It should provide stronger, it's obviously stronger isolation between users than we have now. Um, we get a lot of support requests of long running process on front end node, whatever, because someone's testing their code and he went to lunch and it's just running his simulation single threaded on the node and is going to do this. When it happens on Friday afternoon, the Monday ticket queue looks really ugly because no one else can do anything on that compute node because he's got it CPU bound. So we have other reasons why we would want to come up with this regime, but it's definitely non-trivial to, to just give users VMs as their own front end nodes. Um, and then how about dynamic network access beyond the cluster? So one of the use cases earlier in here was, what if a user wants unfettered internet access. Do we allow Neutron, which is really being controlled by Slurm, which means a user is telling it what to do, do we really want that controlling our infrastructure outside of our cluster? My networking guy says, hell no, I'm not going to allow that. Um, so, you know, do we do static VLAN assignments outside of the cluster? Maybe it goes into the third point, you know, QoS, open flow, traffic shaping, all these other things that SDN give you that we're not doing yet. Um, we have Juniper firewalls sitting around. Do we want to orchestrate our infrastructure so that we can allow the users to reconfigure a larger piece of the network for on-demand stuff? But I think this is definitely the case. That this is way out of scope for a Slurm plugin. But, but for this plugin or for this, this model to extend very far, we're going to have to come up with something that does those things. What that is, I'm not sure. Questions? Uh, Reed's the author of Charlie Cloud. Chuck's my networking guy, and Steve Senator is our uh, Slurm expert. Thanks, Tim. How do you do deterministic IP address assignment? The, so it's a, in the case of containers, we're hoping no one really asked for Charlie Cloud VMs in this regime, because we, we told them they're deprecated. In the case of containers, the, the user is getting access to the bare metal hardware it's already configured. The network namespace should carry that in for us. We're not reassigning the IP when the container is attached to the device. No, the NICs are statically assigned. We had the same thing with Charlie Cloud VMs, and that, that, um, that was one of the reasons why we could do the firewalling we did, which was um, we had a subnet set up so that your Charlie Cloud job with a VM um, had access to this device through this bridge, but the external interface was statically assigned. Um, we had an immediate scaling issue in that the way the scripts were written in the first place, you couldn't go beyond 200. 55 addresses because we ran out. But luckily, we had a 96 node cluster and that wasn't a problem. Any other questions? I do plan to start talking to SCADMD and try to upstream some of this. Um, I don't know that it's generally useful, it's just the direction we're taking right now. You know, one of our like I said earlier, I think the, the prejudices against HPC's view of non-HPC workloads and mechanisms for running those on clusters are ill-held now. They need to fall away. So we're just starting down the road of this. And we have image management. We have a little bit of network management now. It all needs to grow. But I think we're trying to, to prove the case that um, with the existing technologies, with things like OpenStack components, not running a cloud, but using the components as bolt-ons to our clusters, we can give flexibility that's just as performant as if we had a, a bare metal cluster built for a single purpose. Thanks.